Welcome to review and thoughts of the 2022 movie, The Whale. This is not the best choice for Women's History Month, at least as it has Hong Chao as Liz. I do the video now because it only just got to theaters near me. And I'm going to start by telling you this was a movie I loved. This video will have very few jokes and I will get into some serious topics. Now, I realize this video is long, I'm going to do what I can to make it worth your time. I start this video with a review, most likely with zero spoilers. If I spoil anything, I will warn before I do so verbally and hold up an index finger until I'm done with the spoilers. You can mute and skip ahead and you see me lower my index finger. As soon as I end the review itself, please note the rest of the video will have lots of spoilers for both the movie and the play, including discussing the ending. Now, the movie is rated R, and so is this video, and that definitely does make sense. Um, yeah, perhaps the most... Yeah, and certainly, I can... Uh, actually, yeah, I'll... So what the MPAA... The, the full thing from the MPAA is rated R for language, some drug use, and sexual content. There's some really homophobic language in this movie. It's it's very clear that it's being used not to, like, it's not trying to, to um, ah, what's the word? It's not trying to perpetuate the, the hatred. It's trying to, to, you know, display it in a very honest way, and... This is definitely not, if, if, you know, if, if you're, if, if you're someone who is upset by that, you know, this is maybe not a movie for, for you. You know, I, I have a very, when it comes to language, I have very thick skin, but there were times where it really just felt... It's it's a it's a lot, uh, but but I would definitely say and and I'm not gonna you know if you're someone who feels that it was gratuitous I'm not it's especially if you are a member of the LGBTQ community I'm not here to tell you that you're wrong about that uh, you know I can I I try to be an ally but I'm not part of the community now the Yes, so starting with the plot. Idaho. No, really, not New York for once for Aronofsky. Charlie is obese and he wants to reconnect with his estranged teen daughter, Ellie, before it's too late. And let's see. So, so yeah, um, I was always going to watch this movie. There was no doubt about that. You know, if, if I somehow chose not to do this movie, it would have been the first Aronofsky movie that I didn't. And it just, yeah, you know, I, I did a video fairly recently about The Fountain. Uh, actually, yeah, I guess I will. Yeah, never mind. I'll, I'll get to this soon enough. But anyway, yeah. Um... Yes, just for just for Aronofsky, I was definitely going to. I'm really glad that I did. Now let's see. So yeah, for the the you know before I get into details, I want to say the for the technical aspects, the people are very talented and enthusiastic, very clearly, and. That yes, so the let's get into the writing. This was you know Samuel D. Hunter wrote the screenplay and the original play that this was based on, and for him it was autobiographical. And other than this, uh, let's see. Yeah, I gotta say I don't. I'm not familiar with 
but there's so little I might as well mention. Yeah, he wrote 16 episodes between 2016 and 2019 of a TV series called Baskets. He wrote one episode of My America in 2012, which is also a TV series. And he was a co-producer and consulting producer on 11 episodes of Baskets between 2017 and 2018. And that's right, yeah, he is the, the sole listed writer. Now, let's see. Yeah, so I, uh, I'm going to start with one critic quote. At, yeah, at, at one point, a uh, character asks, Do you ever get the feeling people are incapable of not caring? Though meant to show immense empathy and insightfulness of Charlie, any person in a marginalized body will tell you that people really don't care. Few are willing to make accommodation for you, and all too many are eager to judge. Aronofsky and Hunter are no exception. While they try to make Charlie relatable to a thin audience, their own biases verbally and visually make their way on screen. Yeah, I, I can't really... That's, yeah, sadly true. Now, let's see. I, you know, I, I read that line before watching the movie. I, I read that that line would be in the movie before watching the movie. And I wondered if the line is supposed to mean that people can't be indifferent. They're either caring or hateful. But no, the, the movie in context is definitely saying people always care and yeah this movie came out five years since mother it was six years between requiem and fountain four between swan and noah and otherwise you know sometimes he really you know very little time will pass between two movies and let's see right i will just very briefly note i have now watched you know i i mentioned that i realized that i could watch when, when i did the fountain video i noted that i i um yeah disney plus has there are there are three documentary series that are National Geographic that are that that Aronofsky helped create or yeah yeah he is listed as I, I guess he and Ari Handel are listed as creators you know and yeah I went ahead and, and watched them to to have watched everything you know everything Aronofsky that I could get my hands on and let's see yeah, I, you know, I, I wouldn't have watched them if not for Darren, o Darren Aronofsky, but I'm, you know, they were, they were good. They were pretty good. But, yeah, you know, uh, we're all pretty soured on Will Smith now. You know, po we live in a post-slap world, and, you know, don't get me wrong, I 100% empathize with Jada Pinkett for her alopecia, and I think it's ridiculous there are people who blame her for the slap. But, yeah. And, let's see. Yeah, I, I gotta say, the... the Yeah, at, at first I wasn't quite sure. I, I was... I, I honestly would not have guessed that Aronofsky would do something that was like non-fiction. I, I, that, was, that was very surprising to me, but... Yeah, you know, all of his work is about the, not only this, but in part about the the limitations and, and sort of the, the precious nature of the, the human body and the human brain. How we can, under certain pressures, we can completely crumble. You know, that is something that he has a fascination with uh, across all of his work and these three shows uh, yeah that's part of why he is fascinated with uh, w why he created the three shows i got to say the chris hemsworth one at first i was like is this literally just going to be him showing off how manly he is 
once I started watching it, I did realize, you know, he's, as he says, it's because he wants to be able to play with his grandkids when he's old. And that's, you know, that is great. That's a, that's a great motivation for, uh, yeah. I mean, Disney was fine with supporting some of the, the Marvel people making shows like this. Hemsworth makes one about what his body can do. Brie Larson makes one about a diverse group of people across race, LGBTQ, immigration, disability, unhoused, poverty, body issues, expressing the challenges they faced when growing up. Brie Larson continues to be an inspiration. Now, let's see. Right, so, this is not really a plot twist heavy movie. If you, if, if it's important to you that there's, like, big plot twists, this is not a movie for you, plain and simple. And that brings us to the direction. So, yes, uh, directed by Darren Aronofsky. And I have, uh, let's see. Yeah, I guess, so the, the things that he's helped make that I haven't watched. Let's see, there's a 2002 movie called Below. Which I would like to... I, I haven't been able to find it at stores, but I'm going to keep looking because I really like his writing. Protozoa and Supermarket Sweep. Right, and and apparently, like... Um, uh, hmm. Um... Right, yeah, he apparently he directed video segments for the video game adaptation of Soldier Boys, and, I mean, I watched a playthrough of it, so I guess I did see what he directed. No time... Yeah, but I, you know, I, I did watch Fortune Cookie, and what was the other one called... The one with the guy who's obsessed with TV. Uh, and anyway, but yeah. Um, yeah, so. A full ranking of every movie that Darren Aronofsky has... You know, other than this one. Ranking of all movies Darren Aronofsky has directed worst to best. The Fountain is the only that I don't love, so here comes the list. The Fountain, Pi, Requiem for a Dream, The Wrestler, Black Swan, Mother, and Noah. And I think this is a good time to, to briefly... Aronofsky is one of those directors, you don't really know exactly what you're going to get. Like, I can't imagine him doing something that he doesn't really care about. That, you know, the, the basic, you know that he's going to be passionate about it and that really comes across I, I suppose they are all like they do all have the the really manipulative harsh kind of direction but but yeah um, this has the the you know the 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 minimal setting of mother it has the very not not quite the exact same kind of camera work but the very realistic kind of you know very much naturalistic set in the real world kind of thing of the wrestler let's see there is a little bit of the you know he does he does do a little bit of the editing the the that I don't know if I really want to give away what, but but just, you know, this is not Requiem for a Dream. It is not Black Swan. It's, you know, I don't think I really have to say that it's not Noah, because I don't, I don't think he's ever going to make another Noah. But, I mean, I'd be 100% down, but anyway... I'm I'm really impressed. Like after Noah, like considering the the movie, like 
Actually, I forget. Did that movie it was maybe not so well received? But you know, he he's making these movies that don't cost like an absolutely absurd amount. Recently, since Noah, I mean, and other than Noah, you know, he he makes a lot of movies that aren't extremely expensive, and they're they're some of them are very niche. You know, he makes movies that he wants to make regardless of what like you know what 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 are people really asking for like you know like a big chunk of mother honestly if i didn't if i had no idea i might have thought that the first half of mother was like made by roman polanski and not even like necessarily recent polanski it feels like several decades ago Polanski you know cuz like he you know yeah it reminded me of like his his 60s and 70s stuff not so much like what was the the, the was it just called ghost ghost writer or something like that uh, Ewan McGregor and uh one of the former bonds I'm pretty sure you know good movie but you know you can tell that he's changed but anyway, yeah. Um, so let's see. Right, I copied in from IMDb the the trademarks for Darren Aronofsky work. So let's see. The um, yeah, there's not an awful lot of this that. Yeah, uh, in in a lot of the the movies, it's unflinching portrayal of violence to the the human body. Here, it's not really violence, but there is this unflinching portrayal of damage to the body. And yeah, so grieving is one of those universal yet taboo things. We will all do it at least once in our lives, if not for people and for pets. So it's extremely important to do it well in media. Grief is a huge part of Charlie's motivation, and a bunch of reviews don't even mention that he's grieving at all, even though they mention a lot of other con controversial things. That's how much we need to get better at talking about it. And I do think this movie does a good job. Like, you have the... Some people think that grief is just about you never want to think about that person the the person you lost because it just hurts too much that's i'm i'm sure it's true for some but it's for for many of us it's more complex than that it is a there's a there's a sort of push pull going on where on the one hand, we're trying to never think about that person ever again because it just hurts so much to think about. But at the same time, we kind of feel like we have to think about that person. We have to try to focus on it. And I think this movie does a good job of, you know, getting to... Yeah, you know, the... the there's a... Um, yeah, it's it's not a spoiler to say we see the place that the the um, yeah, and it's not a spoiler to to say you know the 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 person that Charlie is grieving over is his boyfriend Alan. And I'm not going to get into exactly how or why he died right now but I, I might not get into that until the the spoiler section but it was a um what's the word um we see the room that he yeah it must have been I, I believe it was the room where the two of them stayed together in this you know, small apartment that Charlie still lives in, and the the um, 
you could understand if he just like had it completely changed so that he would never think about Alan again but instead it basically looks like he he left it the exact same way that it was before almost as if some part of him believes that one day one day it's gonna be a knock at the door door's gonna be opened and it's Alan and he's gonna be so grateful that Charlie didn't change anything about the room that's gonna show Alan just how much Charlie has missed him that he didn't it never even occurred to him to change the room and it is you know we pe grieving people largely realize that that's of course it's never gonna happen but we can't help but still think you know yeah so the the yeah I, I really appreciate the the movies yeah now let's see so this movie is coming out at the exact right time to inspire empathy for LGBTQ individuals on the other hand the movie could have people hating the gay character and it's the exact wrong time wrong time for that I do think you're uh, I think it, few people will by the end of the movie still not have empathy for for Charlie I I you know I'm sh I'm sure there will be some but I would say most people will walk away from the movie having empathy for Charlie. So, after a short break of a few movies, Black Swan, Noah, and Mother, Darren Aronofsky returns to his roots of The Protagonist is a man on a downward spiral. There's at least one woman in his life that wants to help him and or motivates the spiral. So, you know, Pi, Requiem, two of the four leads, The Fountain, The Wrestler, now, let's see. Yeah, so something I noted, I've been rewatching all of the earlier movies, you know. This is this is the only Darren Aronofsky movie I've only watched once. Right, and I I just realized um I forgot to mention I I started recording this video as soon as I got back from the theater, so movies very fresh in my mind. Something I noted on rewatch of the other movies, Darren Aronofsky is probably more critical of systems, groups, and organizations than individuals. The company stalking Mr. Pie. In Requiem for a Dream, we have criticism of the prison system, the mental health care system, the physical health care system. The wrestler criticizes the service industry, the, the way that wait staff are treated you know mother criticizes all of humanity basically and this one is very yeah this one really confronts organized religion there's you know one of the one of the characters is basically like a ah what's it called like a, a missionary you know and the the um let's see he is of course hoping to save charlie's soul and he converses with pretty much everyone else in the film at least once and they don't really mind telling him that they don't think religion is such a good thing Right, I haven't mentioned, and I guess I only just now decided I might swear in this video like they do in the movie. I'm not going to be using any homophobic language, but, you know, yeah. Um, more than one of them uses the, you know, says, you know, fuck religion, or I fucking hate your church, you know, so, yeah. 
and let's see. So yeah, in interview, Darren Aronofsky says this film comes from a place of love and empathy, and I believe him. I don't know if he was necessarily the best choice for this kind of thing, but yeah, I would I would definitely say it is yeah. Now, let's see. Right, so each of his films, Aronofsky uses something that he doesn't do or only uses a little in any of the others. He's always experimenting stylistically, something I really admire about him. You know, Pi, you have multiple groups stalking the protagonist. Requiem has the most extensive use of hip-hop montage. Fountain has multiple time periods greatly spaced apart about the same conflict. Wrestler has this stripped-down documentary feel. Black Swan is very much about doubles. And the, the uh, Shadow Self, I think it's called. You know, Noah goes full Lord of the Rings. Mother every, Mother's everything allegory all at once. And, yeah, um, this is the... Like, this and Mother have small central casts. But this one really does have, like, you know, I, I left before the end credits had rolled, but I was barely out of my seat before the number of move, of, of people who actually appear in the movie was already, like, it's, it's a very, very small number of people who are ever actually in the, yeah, actually, I guess there is this, when you see his students, you know, you see a number of them, but you don't get very much, like, they, they don't have a lot of screen time or character. The, you know, yeah, it basically is. It's like maybe half a dozen people. And, yeah, I, I thought he did a, a good job. None of them felt like it's just, you know, uh, what's the word? Like... None of them felt like they were just there because he, because Aronofsky, you know, or or I guess Samuel D. Hunter, since he wrote the screenplay, just because they had something that they really wanted to say with that character. Now, let's see. Aronofsky has said on multiple occasions that he believes we have a responsibility to show violence realistically. It shouldn't be fun in movies. So what he's doing with Charlie is probably supposed to be showing a harsh reality, as he in general does in his movies. The problem is that it could encourage hatred and bullying of the overweight. And let's see. So, so yeah, he likes Aronofsky likes to make dramas with some psychological horror elements. It's definitely a drama. I'm not sure. I would really say there's very much. Maybe, maybe no psychological horror or really. Yeah, I'm. I'm not sure. I would really say horror or thriller. There's there's a couple of bits where. You feel like, okay, this is going in a direction, but, you know, by and large, it's it's not really... Yeah, it is, it is primarily a drama. Now, so yeah, um, I, I re-watched my videos on the other ones, and I, I realized Aronofsky had covered every major fictional film genre except historical and biography. And honestly, I mean, technically, Noah is arguably historical, and technically, this fits biography. So, yeah, he's done every non, every fiction genre, not nonfiction, but yeah. Now, let's see. Right, so I have a critic quote here that I think is pretty good. Early in the movie, it felt like the movie was just trying to gawk at Charlie. It makes you feel uncomfortable for watching. Later on, you realize there's more going on there, and it's heartbreaking. I compare it most to The Wrestler. And, yeah, some people say it's too manipulative and point out that it's misery porn, like... You know, Aronofsky, that's basically his his whole... Everything he makes as the, the misery porn. And for sure, you know, if, if you... This might actually be an okay 
movie to make your first Un unless the language is really going to going to put you off but this isn't as you know it's it's a um, it's grueling it's it's really like you feel really bad for charlie and the way the movie films him and edits these sequences is you know pretty uncomfortable but it is the the movie doesn't get as like just you know i i don't know yeah i i maybe he mellowed a little i guess but but yeah um you know, for sure, like, the first couple of movies he made, okay, Angie Teenager, we get it, you know, they're great films, but let's be honest, they, they are, you know, I know he wasn't literally a teenager at the time, you know, even when he was making student films, I'm, I'm pretty sure he was already an adult, you know, I don't, I don't think, can you enter film school before you're of age? Anyway, but yeah, you know, they have that kind of energy to them. And, and, yeah, in, in some ways this feels a bit more like life experience, kind of. But, but yeah, um, moving on. Yeah, some, some critics say it's body shaming and homophobia in the guise of tough love. And, yeah, I... Uh, I definitely see what they mean. Now, and, and, you know, for sure it's still necessary to inspire empathy. To this day, you have people cruelly body shaming and, you know, calling LGBTQ people pedophiles, which is just absurd. That's not, you know, that's the exception, not the rule. Like, if you want to, if you want to go after a group and say, oh, pedophiles, Catholic priests, that's, you know, they spent a lot of money trying to cover it up, and you know now it's out. But yeah, there's actually there's a comment on a negative review of the film that just goes, and this is a direct quote: "This article was written by a fat person," as if that means we shouldn't take the review seriously. Honestly, just like she, I I would be ashamed to to leave a comment like that on someone else's. Like if you don't think that, you know. It's a it's a review. Obviously, you're free to disagree, you know. But the the yeah. Anyway, uh, right. Some you know a number of critics point out it's like a stage play, which is what it was based on. Some critics feel that's good, others bad. I kind of thought that it worked, but there's definitely like there's a number of things that you see, like every time someone. Um, approaches or leaves yeah you know there there's a um, like uh, Charlie doesn't like people seeing him so he like covers the windows and such but there's a little bit like the, the there's some light that gets through so some you know when when someone is approaching the front door you'll see the shadow gradually moving across you know, and and vice versa when they when they leave again. You know, and there's this thing of Charlie puts this plate of like I'm guessing like cut up fruit or something like that, cut cut up apple maybe on you know on on this um, right outside the window for you know this bird to to eat. And these things, you know, they, they happen multiple times. Now, I don't really go to the theater anymore, but, you know, to, to be clear, I have the utmost respect for people. Like, I, I don't even, I, th I think it takes just so much guts to even consider live performance like that. That's just yeah and and night after night and just yeah i i <sighs> okay i never played something particularly interesting i would argue when i was a kid and my parents insisted you know i 
I've always preferred to comment on things rather than make my own, you know. But yeah, when I was younger, I, you know, I did do a little acting in, in stage shows. But I never had a, a big role, you know. So I never felt the, the kind of really intense pressure that, you know, the, the leads do. But, but yeah, from my experience, both performing and watching the you know stage plays when i was yeah a, a, a child you know before i became a teenager i know that there are thing you know things like that that's a that's something you can do in a in a stage show that you know you don't necessarily see that many movies that do that exact kind of thing and and sometimes when you do that's because it was inspired by a stage play but yeah, I I don't know. I just I felt like it worked. I'm I'm just I'm glad that it didn't get lost in translation in in adaptation because the fact that like he orders pizza like frequently. You know, we see several of his several days of his life, and I yeah, it honestly kind of looks like maybe once a day he orders pizza and he doesn't want the pizza delivery guy to even see him so he leaves the money in the in the post uh, what, what do y'all call that in English um, post post box PO box you know so that so that the guy can get the money and he asks him just put the pizza right outside the door and then the guy leaves, which again, you know, you you see you see the the shadow through the light in the, the window, and then Charlie gets out there, gets the pizza, and goes in and eats. And the fact that like there are all these times where someone, you know, he goes to such great lengths for people to not see him not interact directly with him and yeah it's just you know you 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 watch it and it's legitimately sad to see and hold on I'm just gonna make sure the thing is there we go now but but yeah for sure you know let's see um some of the things that they that the people thought was bad about it being like a stage play is that you know when when you have a movie it's naturalistic and the the you know in a, in a stage play you can kind of you can accept okay maybe that's not supposed to be literal and some of the things do like it is very much it is a movie of people having conversations where multiple yeah so, some of the time you don't really like it's like why are these people having this conversation right now right here and I can imagine that probably plays better in in a stage version because you know it it seems like pretty much everything we see is literally happening you know it's not like Aronofsky is shy about letting us know no 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 this is not really happening in his movies here it tends to be so yeah now let's see right and and one critic said is the director's tendency to underline every point every symbolic connection and make them unmistakable for the viewer that leaves the whale feeling like a lofty yet tedious exercise and they gave it a two out of four and I see what they mean I wouldn't quite go I wouldn't go quite that far now let's see so yeah the, the movie starts with the um, his name is Thomas. Might just call him Tom for brevity. The the um, ah, what's the name? The the uh, word. The uh, not emissary, missionary. That's it. 
getting off a bus and going up to, to Charlie's place. And yeah, we, we see the, you know, it, it is this, um, there's this interesting, the skies are dark. Like it looks like it might thunder soon. And the, like, the nature, there's this, like, some of it looks very, like, spent and broken down, but there is still some nature left, so, yeah, you get the sense that, like, you know, bad things are coming, some, some really bad things have already happened, but there's still hope left, you know, he's not subtle. And, let's see... Yeah, the the start of the movie does a good job of, like, you. It sets a tone. You you immediately get a sense of, the, the situation. Now I'm not gonna give away whether it's a happy en happy ending or a sad ending, but, the ending. In some ways fits with what came before. I think the ending is good and it does not use Deus Ex Machina or other convenient writing. And there are there, there's you know I, I I I felt pretty confident, but just in case I did Google it. According to, to Google there is nothing after you know once once the end credits start rolling there's no, you know, there are no extra scenes, nothing, just, yeah. And that brings us to the characters. So, Brendan Fraser plays Charlie, an overweight and reclusive English professor, and see yeah so there are uh, I got a couple of critic quotes amazing as everyone in the cast are he's like a Christ figure a martyr letting people abuse him not a real rather than a real person he's the the way he's filmed uh, right he's filmed and the scenes ogling his body are scored like a horror movie monster that is sadly true I yeah, uh, I'm not sure Aronofsky was the best person for the, you know, probably required someone, as, you know, F Film Brain puts it, you know, it was maybe, it should maybe have been someone who was more subtle. I forget if he also used the word sensitive. And, and it's not, I, I, I really don't think that um, Aronofsky has ill will towards, you know, the 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 overweight or LGBTQ. But the I don't think he's doing them as many favors as he thinks he is here. And let's see. yeah, you know, the the introduction to a character can really color how you see them. So. It's not an accident that Charlie is introduced masturbating to gay porn, an action and a type of porn many, especially on the right, think are unacceptable. And, you know, a lot of people don't really think of, you know, the, the, the idea that the disabled, that the disabled people have any kind of sexual you know that yeah a lot of people don't like to think about that to be clear i'm not saying that everyone who's overweight is disabled but the the level of you know yeah the the he is you know charlie is in fact is disabled the the yeah because of the and and the um yeah let's see 
So yeah, uh, Requiem for Dream also shows protagonists in a negative light at first, and they do soon after build empathy, and this does uh, as well. And let's see, yeah, you know, the way Charlie is filmed has less empathy for him than the way Sarah Goldfarb was filmed in Requiem for a Dream, and the gross mouth sounds of Charlie are worse than Arnold the Therapist in Requiem for a Dream. Now, um, I gotta say, I, I, I haven't watched that much Brendan Fraser. I'm glad he's back, because clearly he's incredibly talented. And... You know, I I um I haven't um I don't know if I feel qualified to to talk about exactly why he was gone, but yeah, I I will just I yeah I'm really glad he's back. I would like to watch more of his stuff. I think other than this, I'm not sure I've seen anything other than. The, the Mummy movies, and George of the Jungle, you know, so. And in my defense, George of the Jungle, I knew that there was some connection to Weird Al Yankovic when I watched it, and at the time, I would have watched anything if there was a connection to Weird Al Yankovic. Now, yes, so, Charlie's estranged teenage daughter, Ellie, you know, if the actress did not play the role well, could Sadie sink the whole enterprise? Yes, but thankfully she does well. She joins the long line of young white women, at least not all of them are straight, upset and or disappointed with the young white male exclusively straight lead. Usually the woman is a direct relative. Let's see. Um... Yeah, direct relative, close friend, or the like. You know, in, in Mother, the woman is the lead, so we get some more development for her. I agree that Aronofsky will sometimes film the woman that he's with in a very flattering light, but only when that is relevant to the story and themes. He's not like Paul W. Anderson and Len Wiseman. We're clearly doing it just to show off. You know, so, yeah, just briefly. So, Mother and The Fountain both have some of that going on, but... Yeah, you know, in both cases, you know, Mother, it's about how fertile she, you know, because she is a, you know, she's a metaphor. So, yeah, fertility is important there. And the fountain, it is this, you know, yeah, it's, it's the, the fact that the the Hugh Jackman character has basically you know he he basically thinks of Izzy as like you know basically an an angel you know that he has to save now let's see right um some critics say that Ellie is cartoonishly evil i'm not sure Aronofsky has a high opinion of daughters now he doesn't have any of his own, so it's not based on real-life hostility. He has a sister. Maybe he's upset with how she treated their parents. Like, obviously, in real life, all women are daughters. But when Aronofsky shows a woman with one or both parents, they tend to be harsh. Though, there is always at least some reason for it, rejecting their parents. Stephanie, Nina, Ela, I think, you know, Emma Watson and, and Noah... Sure, that's not many, but the rejection is intense. When he shows them not as daughters, he has more empathy. Devi, the, the neighbor in Pi, Marion, Sarah, Isabel, Cassidy, mother, the mother for mother. Black Swan is the exception. Every woman in that comes out looking bad, but we're seeing them through Nina's point of view, and to her, they represent pressure and replacements. But yeah, um, I definitely... It might have been good if this had been, you know, if, if this did come across as less naturalistic and more kind of, you know, playing with is this reality or isn't it, you know, the, the, he's not, 
exactly shy about, you know, oh, I don't know, do, is is what we're seeing happening, or is it, I think I already said that, anyway, so, you know, Pi, Requiem for a Dream, Black Swan, and Mother have scenes that... You know, yeah, we're, we're, like, at least some of it, you're like, that didn't happen. There's no way that actually happened. That has to be a hallucination or a metaphor or something. And the, the, the vast majority of this movie does not really do that. And because of it, it means that we end up, you know, we, we get the sense that what we're seeing is actually happening, that the people are real people, not metaphors and such. It's interesting. I'll, I'll give him that. I'll, I'll, uh, if he, like, if he literally directed traffic, I would probably have to at least, at least check it out, just see. Because you always find something interesting. I I think it might have been good if he had this more kind of if if it was a little more like possible hallucinations and such. The characters in this don't really. I I think an argument could be made for Liz. Other than her, I don't know that I would really say that the characters completely act like any human would. You know, not Charlie, not Ellie, not Tom. Yeah. Um, but, but yeah, she does a really great job. I, I'm not familiar with her other work, but, you know, the, certainly... I, I, you know, I, I know that she is on Stranger Things. You know, this is... This role is the kind of thing where, like, a lot of people... A lot of people would be hesitant to... Um, what's the word? You know, but she throws herself into it despite the fact that like if people can't see past this role of hers you know she's very very harsh and and very unpleasant like it's it's important that people don't think this is what she's like off camera you know it's important that you know that they could still get her roles where she's you know much more sympathetic but, you know, clearly she realizes that this, this is a really, like, she has a chance. This, this might be, like, it, it might open a lot of doors for her. You know, I, I, I don't really know about Stranger Things, but certainly when I, when I hear people talk about it, it doesn't seem like, she plays a character that's, like, she's, uh, her Ellie is pretty despicable, and that's on the page, you know, it's not just something she decided one day and they just went with it, no, 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 this is, she's, she's a very, very abrasive person, and, yeah, it's definitely, like, that actually might be the the one thing. Like, be be ready for that if you do make this your first Aronofsky. And JC Sink plays young Ellie, so that yeah yeah her younger sister, which you know it's it's always neat when they are able to to do that kind of thing. And. Hong Chao plays Liz, a nurse and Charlie's best friend who takes care of him. Her performance really makes you stand up, put your hands together, and clap. 
just once loudly to get the attention of everyone in the restaurant so you can explain the philosophy. Seriously though, she's amazing in the menu and here. And yes, I know, technically it's not her, it's, you know, it's Ray Fiennes doing the, the clapping, but that that still is a very memorable trait. But but yeah, you know, she has she she's all the heart, like, and yeah, she's 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 really, really good in this. And Ty Simpkins plays Toss, religious Christian missionary for I wanna say they call it New Life. And I gotta say, like Ty Simp So Harley from Iron Man 3. I guess he had to go somewhere after Tony kind of abandoned him in face in favor of Peter Parker. Yeah. Um last thing I've you know, yeah, okay, so technically I've seen him in something a little more recent, but I'm not going to Okay, no, yeah, it's not a spoiler to say that he makes a brief appearance as Harley in Endgame, Avengers Endgame. Other than that, I haven't seen him in anything since, or anything else. Iron Man 3, that was ten years ago. So, yeah, um, I'm not even sure I would have... I, I might have struggled to really recognize him if not for... You know, when I watched Endgame, I was like, okay, I, I read that Harley's going to be in this, so, you know, and, yeah, it's, you know, when you when you see him, it's like, I guess that's Harvey? It's, you know, who else would it be? Um, he really, he, yeah, he, he, he's much taller, and, but, but still, you know, he was, he, I, you know, I stand by. I do think that Iron Man 3 is really, really good. It's, it's a great MCU movie. Anyway, yeah, he's really good in that, and he's really, really good here. The, the, you know, it's, I think it very easily could have ended up with him basically just being there for other people to yell at about religion and that really would have been just it, it would have been a shame and and kind of a waste of him you know clearly he you know yeah he's he's good i'd i'd watch if if they put him in a movie and he's like the lead you know the way that sometimes like um i can't believe i'm blanking on his name but the the kid who played you know, from the from the road, and he played the young Nightcrawler. You know, Slow West. He was pretty much the lead in that, though. You know, obviously, um, Fastbender did a lot of of heavy lifting as well. But yeah, I I would be happy to see Ty Simpkins take on a full like lead role in in something big. But yeah. Um, Right, and Samantha Morton plays Mary, Charlie's ex-wife and Ellie's mother. And Satya Sri Sridharan plays Dan, a pizza delivery worker. And yeah, Aronofsky did not find a way to get Mark Margolis in there. And... Or that actor he cast to be a pervert each time. Now, let's see. So yeah, the 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 dialogue is very obvious. Like you you really get okay. This is this is important. Like certain words and phrases are used a number of times to really hammer home to make sure you don't miss anything. And there are definitely times where it's like, you know, okay, the 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 cast are very talented that they're managing to 
get some of this stuff said in a way that doesn't sound completely ridiculous when, like, it seems almost impossible to, yeah. That brings us to the cinematography by Maddie Libatique. As per usual, they do quite like working together, he and Aronofsky. Now, so yeah, um, right, he, he DP'd Don't Worry Darling, which I haven't watched. I, if it ends up on Disney+, Plus, I, I might watch it. Now, you know, these days I watch so many movies in, in theaters, so I, yeah, I, I don't watch everything that I would like to. He, yeah, he DP'd Birds of Prey, which, yeah, that is, they did an excellent, that, that movie is incredibly well shot. And... He did DP Venom, but there are also shots in that movie that are really, really compelling. Uh, let's see. Cowboys and Aliens, which is also, like, I'm not going to claim that movie is amazing, but some of the shots in it are like, okay, wow they watch westerns like they didn't just you know decide ah oh, western alien you know that might be fun no 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 they have watched westerns there's a very distinct Sergio Leone you know inspiration in some of the shots in that movie let's see but yeah he does a really great job here. It is, um, let's see. Oh, right, yeah, yeah. Um, some critics say the way it's filmed is claustrophobic. Some say it isn't. And, you know, it's also, yeah, some people think that it's good that it's claustrophobic. Some people think that it's bad. Uh, you know, there's definitely a claustrophobic feeling to a lot of the cinematography. And that's, like, Charlie has basically built himself a prison here. Like, he's not, he doesn't have to live the way he does, but he has made some choices that have led to, you know, and, yeah, the, the cinematography underlines that this is, you know, yeah, yeah, the, like, you can open the door, and, like, there's no guards, technically, but he's basically in, he, he made himself a prison, and, you know, in, there are times where he himself would acknowledge that that is what's, what's going on. So yeah, it's it's very it's good that the cinematography um you know is yeah, is on the same page there because it's clearly like if you if you just look at like the the set dressing and such you could get you know I, like I mentioned, you know, he covers the windows like he lives, like, if he, if he stopped covering the windows, and don't get me wrong, I don't, personally, I don't think anybody should feel like they have to, you know, they have to interact that much with other people if it's not absolutely, you know, necessary. But that is, that is a choice he made, you know, he's, he's limiting how much light gets in. That's the, you know, he's, like... If he were, like, sitting, you know, always in the dark and, like, emo makeup and such, you'd be like, oh, okay, it's, you know, no, it's, but, but that's not, that's not what's happening. It is just because he doesn't want to let anyone see him, so he takes that away from himself as well, you know, and, yeah, you know, the, the camera does underline, yeah, it's, you know, it's pretty claustrophobic, and 
the the yeah, I I really really let's see. Right. Uh, let's see. Does the camera follow a major character from behind? If not, it would be one of the rare Aronofsky films. No, yeah, yeah, there is at least one part where the camera follows. Yeah. And the editing. This was edited by Andrew Weissblum, who also edited Tick, Tick, Boom, The Eyes of Tammy Faye, The French Dispatch, Mother, Alice Through the Looking Glass, Noah, Moonrise Kingdom. Black Swan, The Wrestler, yeah, so they, yeah, he, did, uh, when, when Aronofsky finds someone that he likes to work with, he likes to bring them back for everything. Now, let's see, yeah, so the editing here, they do a good job of letting, like, the, um, it's not a fast-paced movie. It's not one of those movies where there's constantly something. It's one of those movies that gets across that Charlie's existence is legitimately very sad and very tedious without the movie itself being... I, I would argue, I, I did not find it tedious. I was never bored for a second... But it definitely gets across that this is a very, like, the life he's living is just, you know, you no, nobody should have to live like that. And, yeah, I, I really appreciate, like, the, 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 the uh, sort of natural thing to do would be to make it, tight and just you know okay we're in we're out done but no instead the you know it will linger and that's why you know that's that's the thing he does so well uh, one of the many things he does so well in these movies even the short ones even the act even the literal shorts linger in your mind you know it's i mean by now i guess it's been like a month since i watched fortune cookie but i can't get it out of my mind you know he just he really has a, a knack for uh, yeah and and yeah he does he does it really well here and let's see that brings us right so the the budget I'm going to really quickly find... Right, so this is estimated to have cost $10 million. And the worldwide gross is $32 million. Now, that is... that Yeah, that's that's pretty good for the... Yeah, so, you know, and and I can understand why. And it does also, uh, what's the word? Um, it does, uh, you can tell that they did have, you know, a, a decent budget on it. It doesn't feel like they had to make, like they had to to omit stuff because they couldn't afford it. Now the music. Let's see. Yeah. So the composer is Rob Simonson, and I'm not sure I'm familiar with the other stuff he has done. Um. Yeah, not really ringing any bell. But yeah, uh, the, the score is very good. And yeah, you know, it is this thing of... 
I already mentioned the the there's some like monster movie music and the the yeah you know it's it's um the music isn't subtle uh, Aronofsky doesn't particularly seem super interested in in yeah it's not you know like I the the music I love the music of Pi and Requiem for Dream like Lux Eterna is just amazing like it's no wonder it's like there's like a million trailers that use Lux Eterna and it's yeah and and the the I once edited something to Lux Eterna because I love it so much. The the um yeah, it's this this movie does not have as memorable a score as Pi and Requiem for a Dream. Now the sound design is you know as usual the the what's the word um yeah the the um yeah i i saw you know i i watched some video essays about aronofsky and one of them pointed out aronofsky's sound design lets us hear what his characters feel it's not what's it, it's not what it sounds like. If, if you were next to the character, you wouldn't be hearing what we are hearing as the viewer. We're hearing what it feels, you know, yeah. And, yeah, there's there's some of that in, in this. It's not the... I'm, I'm not sure I would say it's the very best of them, but there's definitely some really, really good stuff. And let's see. So the I actually I I meant to write down how long it was, but I was so moved by the ending, I completely forgot to write down. But uh, you know, according to to IMDb, it is an hour and fifty seven minutes, and that's probably yeah I I I can believe that. Now, that brings us... So, the best element is probably the exploration of important issues. You know, grief and the, the shame and isolation felt by plus-sized people, by the LGBTQ community... And let's see. Yeah, the the worst aspect is probably that the 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 framing of Charlie really feels like it comes from a you know it doesn't feel like it has empathy for him. And I do think that is uh, an issue that. You know, I can understand. I, th I think, well, yeah, for some people, it straight up ruined the movie for them, and yeah, I can I can absolutely understand why. Now, so so yeah, the the thing I most came across when looking at other people's reviews as something that they really hated was that the stage play setup was too limiting. Now. I don't really, yeah, I, I don't really uh, agree with that, but, you know, uh, um, I think it was the, the right choice for this. Like, I don't think making this movie, like, let's see, um, yeah, let's say it had a lot of different settings. Or a much bigger cast of characters. The I don't think these things would have made the movie better. Although 
I can understand, you know, certainly there's some people, you know, it would make it more commercially viable, but I don't think it would make it better. I, I really admire that he's making, I don't know if he's making movies like This and Mother while, like, so many movies, you know, there, there are so many studios today that are terrified of taking chances, and then Aronofsky makes something like this. Anyway, um, yeah, I agree that it is, it, it definitely does impose certain limits. I think it was the right choice, but yes, if you think, if, if you're someone who hasn't decided on whether or not to watch this movie yet, and you're worried that the stage play setup will limit what it does too much, there's a there's a chance you you will end up feeling that way about the movie and that it might completely ruin the movie for you so fair warning now I was most worried that the Christ symbolism would be too obvious and yeah the it it really really is now yeah the thing I was most looking forward to was more Aronofsky and yeah dude does not let me down I I yeah now the so so yeah um the trailers do give at least a little too much away they do give you some inkling of what the movie is like but this is a difficult movie to make a trailer for that is both representative and appealing to a like mainstream audience i think they did a pretty decent job on the on the trailers there's a there's a one minute one and a two minute one yeah they they did pretty fine now you know I'm, I'm not sure I would necessarily say that the trailers are worth like seeking out they they work as just telling you the movie exists here's a here's a smidgen of what it's like the cover and poster do not give too much away. And there is a, a hint of what the movie is like in the cover and posters. Now, on Rotten Tomatoes, this has a 67% based on 163 reviews and a 96% audience score, but it's based on fewer than 50 verified ratings, so... Yeah, it's just a, f a few people really loved it, I guess. Now, the consensus is held together by a killer Brendan Fraser. The Whale sings a song of empathy that will leave most viewers blubbering. That's that's cute. I like that. And, yeah, so the 67%, you know, uh, the average rating was 6.90 out of 10. And of the 163 reviews, 110 of them were fresh. And the audience ratings, the average rating was 4.6 out of 5. So, yeah, it is fresh. And on Metacritic, it has a 61 out of 100, based on 43 critic reviews. And a, uh, what does that say? An 8.1, based on 14 ratings for users. Um, yeah, on IMDb, there are 31 user reviews, 22 of, if you don't count the ones with spoilers, so I, yeah, I read the 22, and, let's see, yeah, the, the IMDb user ratings, it has an 8.3 out of 10. Based on 5,411 IMDb users, 56% gave it a 10, 12.2 gave it an 8, 11.4 gave it a 9, 6.2 gave it a 1, 5.5 gave it 7, 3.2 gave it 6, 2% gave it 5, 1.4 gave it 4, 1.1 gave it 3, 1.0 gave it 2. So, yeah, it's very, very popular. Now, 
let's see the yeah special effects I have a critic quote here Fraser has been outfitted with a digital fat suit the effects that bulk him up are a blend of prosthetics and CGI and the result is that we see someone who looks at home in his flesh I've watched a lot of movies that have fat suits and a number of them like you know they've been good at making you know fat suits that look pretty convincing and still allow the actor to to move you know the uh, the what are they called nutty professor movies for example you know but the um those are for you know those characters don't weigh as much as Charlie does. This is the the most convincing that I've ever seen, and it really is like this is this is like the Yoda puppet in Empire Strikes Back. Like if you see through the the illusion, the movie falls apart. It's just not gonna work at all. You're you're just not gonna be able to take it seriously for even a second. If when you look at his body, and there are a lot of shots in this movie that are looking at Charlie's body, if we don't believe that what we're seeing is real, the movie falls apart. And yeah, they, they really do an incredible job there. Uh, apparently the guy who made the, the suit went on to do Megan or Mithrigan. So, yeah. Um, very, very talented. Uh, there's some really excellent stunt work. Now, let's see. The... Right, so there will be a couple of links in the description box. I'm just going to make sure that... So let's see there. So we have the that one. And the that one. Yeah, they're all there. And... Yeah, so for some of these, I like to, to mention what I think is the, the best line of the movie. Um, yeah, a character asks Tom, Are you with New Life? He responds, uh, Yeah. And then they follow up with, I fucking hate New Life. And... That brings us to yeah um, I rate this eight heartfelt attempts at connecting the family out of ten now right so this is the part where I update the overall let's see I suppose ultimately yeah I um, yes this is my ranking of all feature films directed by Darren Aronofsky worst to best and the fountain is the only that I don't love the fountain pie the whale requiem for dream the wrestler black swan mother and Noah and that brings us to the thoughts section. So I am gonna note it is. There we go. Yes. So starting with thoughts, no, notes taken while watching in padded paper form. So. So yeah, the one of the first shots is the slow, slow zoom 
onto the black square where Charlie's webcam feed should be. And, yeah, you know, it, um, before we see him, the, the, you know, basically, the, the, he is willing to show nothing of what he looks like to most of the rest of the world. And, you know, the, the, you know, we see the, we can see several of his students in their, you know, it's, it's a, it's a Zoom feed, you know, or, yeah, yeah, you know what I mean. So it's, you know, we're seeing them and like this, some of the students, they look kind of bored, but they do look like they're basically fine where they are. Like they're maybe not like top of the world, super happy, but they don't look trapped and the fact that you know the the slow zoom in on the black square that you know the the fact that it's a black square is that he refuses to show anything of himself you know not not even just like his face or something and the the uh, what's the word uh yeah, you know, the the fact that it is like this one, you know, it's it's like he is trapped, basically. And, you know, he thinks that he is dying, and the one thing he asks, you know, for, for Tom to do is to read the, you know, parts of the essay to him. And... Yeah, you know, afterwards, you know, Tom, Tom is like, why, I don't understand why you asked me to read it to you. And he says, because I thought I was dying. You know, he's, he's okay with dying. It doesn't bother him that he might very soon die. He just wants the, the you know, it's important to him that as he's dying, he, you know, he hears those words or or reads them to himself or something. Okay, that's not gonna work. Uh right. Yeah, so Liz and Tom talk you know, talk about religion and yeah, you know, Liz points out, you know, it brought a lot of pain into my family. Let's see. And, yeah, you know, both, like, at, at first, Liz is like, you can't just lie here and die, but eventually she does, you know, she, she sits down, you know, she brings him the, the um, chicken bucket, yeah, yeah, bucket of chicken and, and the whole thing, you know, basically they're resigned to the fact of his death, and... I appreciate that pretty much every time the television is turned on, like, not every single time, but pretty much every single time, it's, you know, election stuff, and every single time they mention how well Trump is doing, which, you know, so yeah, it, obviously it, it is set before he became president, and you know the fact that like obviously it is a progressive movie the the major characters espouse progressive values and the movie is yeah you know it's trying to get empathy for you know plus size people and the lgbtq community and the fact that like yeah Every, every time they they you know the you know they they sit and try to watch the news each time it's like oh you know Trump is doing really well which <laughs> Aronofsky's never been subtle 
you know it it is very much and you know don't you know i get it it's what wh i've i idaho i think so you know yeah they would focus a lot on elections but the fact that each time you know i mean the movie was made after trump's you know so the the in fact, I th they they probably I feel like I read somewhere that the the shooting schedule put it after Trump's re-election loss. You know, um, after Biden won in twenty twenty, so they could have you know they could have omitted politics or they could have focused on the. Yeah. Anyway, the the um, or wait, was it actually? Maybe maybe they were for Trump's second campaign. And anyway, my point is they're talking they're they're talking about how well Trump is doing with a lot of voters and. Considering that the, you know, the rest of the movie is basically Charlie slowly killing himself by overeating and not doing anything to take care of, you know, don't, don't get me wrong, I 100% I empathize, it's very difficult once you get to that point to still do much, but he really is refusing to, to do you know, he he is ready to die, and yeah, the you know, Trump made a lot of people want to to die. And let's see. yeah, so we have the scene of him going to bed and yeah and he's got all these drawers of snack foods and he goes over the essay and he, through Google he you know sees just how bad his heart is And yeah, we meet Ellie, and she is very harsh from right away. And you know, she straight up says, "I don't know why I'm here." And fair enough, the screenplay really did not give much of an indication of why she did end up showing up. And yeah, you know, he tells her she can have. 120k and apparently she wrote a threat she, you know, she wrote something threatening to one of her class or about one of her classmates that's really messed up not sure it was necessary to push it that far and it's really gross when she says when she tells him to walk to her making him fall and then abandoning him there and yeah we see as I mentioned in the review we see the um, oh, wait. we see that the the you know he doesn't open the door when the pizza delivery man is there they have an agreement now and you know Liz is upset Charlie saw Ellie and we get the explanation about the the custody and yeah Liz expresses frustration with Charlie who does not follow her advice and he even starts choking and she you know she helps him <coughs> hmm 
but also gets very upset with him because he, you know, it was because he didn't chew the food properly. And Ellie absolutely hates this Walt Whitman poem, you know, delivering some very harsh analysis, which, if this was, like, actually, yeah, I can't help but wonder if this, oh, wait, yeah, uh, Samuel D. Hunter wrote this, I guess, so, I don't know, I, you know, having just rewatched the, the first couple of, or, or yeah, Having rewatched all of his movies, but yeah, when especially when I rewatched Pi and Requiem for Dream, it's like wow, he's still he is still an edgy teenager, even though he is, you know, he's he's in his twenties making those movies, but yeah. And yeah, um, let's see, Ellie and Tom talk religion, and I do gotta say, like I I did really like you know. At first, she's like, you know what I like about religion, you know, and it's, it's, yeah, she she briefly says, you know, and and for like a second, it's like, oh, okay, she's like, you know, she's saying something positive. That's the, you know, and then she says, what I don't like about religion is, oh, okay, yeah, I almost forgot who you were for a second there. Who are you, and what have you done with Ellie? And yeah, the the it was it was a very awkward moment when like <laughs> when the when when Charlie and Tom are like trying to convince the other no 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 I'm I'm not into you it's not it's not that you know and. The, the, um, yeah, you know, Charlie gets him to pick up the key so they can unlock Alan's room. And, let's see, yeah, at this point I noted, everyone tells Tom to leave. Like, you know, Charlie's kind of nice about it. He's like, I mean, I already read the, the literature. I read the Bible a couple of times. It's a pretty depressing story, honestly, you know. I like the bit with horses. And the, the you know, but but yeah, Ellie is like, what are you, get out of here, you know. And, and Liz, 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 when it comes to Tom, Liz isn't like, get out. She's like. Stay. We're gonna have a conversation. That's what we're gonna do. If I ever met Hong Chao in person, and she was like, I'm gonna explain something to you. I think I might run screaming in the other direction. She is very intense. And she... Yeah. I honestly, I'm not sure which of the care if If... I would rather encounter her character in the menu or Liz, but yeah, in in both cases, like, like she straight up, no, 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 okay, here, you're gonna sit in this chair, I'm gonna sit in that chair, and I'm gonna explain to you exactly what's so fucked up about not just Christianity, not just religion, but your church. In particular, and let's see. yeah, and you know we we find out you know Alan, Charlie's you know dead boyfriend was Liz's brother, and that legitimately is you know that that's something that. You know the the kind of bittersweet thing about grieving is sometimes you really connect with people that you know it's not like it's not necessarily this thing of like oh we're best friends now we could do anything together but there is this kind of thing like 
if you care deeply about someone that you've lost and you encounter someone else who knew that person in a you know in a different way who who didn't you didn't already know them for another reason yeah it can it can forge a relationship in a in a very weird kind of like it's it's one thing if if the person is still alive and they're like okay you know they're they're talking to you and explaining you got to meet this other person that I already know you're going to go you're going to get along just so well you got to meet them and they introduced you and you know you have a relationship but the relationship starting after the person you had in common is already dead but but yeah you know and and uh hold on Let's see. Had had Liz met? Um, I'm not entirely sure if she met. Um, if if she had met Charlie before, the the no yeah yeah she had I think, but they didn't have much of a relationship, and then the you know they. Yeah, yeah, I th I think that is how. The... Now let's see. Yeah, I I love that Ellie wrote a haiku, and so does Charlie. Like absolutely, and and it is like you know, it's like on the surface, we, you know, and she she wants you to only read the surface. You know, it it looks like, oh wow, she just wrote you know a little bit of. You know she's she's annoyed. What, what was it? This place this place stinks. This pad is our word. I hate everyone. You know that just sounds like, okay. Yeah, teenager, definitely a teenager wrote that. But no, if you you know he he sits there and counts the, you know, and I I couldn't help myself. I did as well. I. I believe it is, in fact, a haiku that's, yeah. And, yeah, Ellie explains why she hates Charlie. And you do understand, like, being abandoned at age eight, that really is, yeah. And we learn that she put... You know, I've uh, what was it? A Ambien? I, f I forget what it is, but but yeah, some some drug in his sandwich, and then you know she's smoking pot in front of Tom. She gets him to admit he used to have a problem with pot, and. I gotta say, I, I did really appreciate, you know, this thing of, like, at first he said that, you know, when, when he says, I, I shouldn't smoke pot, she's like, yeah, because your parents told you that, you know, which, yeah, it is it is like a lot of people, I, I don't personally have any experiences with, with pot or any drugs, but... From what I hear, like pot is absolutely nothing compared to the the heart. You know, a lot of people smoke weed, and it doesn't affect their ability to live a normal life. You know, the way that like heroin, meth, cocaine, that those kinds of things will really fuck you up. You know, so yeah. You know, at first she's like, yeah. Your parents told you it was, you know, and then he's like, no, I did actually smoke, you know, and, and yeah, like, it is, there is this interesting thing of her, like, she gets the truth out of people. She, she does, you know, she keeps pushing until she eventually, and the, the, yeah, I, I don't know, I, I gotta say, honestly, from watching the movie, I don't know if it's like that she should write necessarily. I, f I feel like, I don't know, uh, I guess Jessica Jones doesn't, she's not great with like the, the um, 
assistants and such. I don't know. Uh, maybe, maybe she could take on a protege or or something. Cause, like, I feel like that's where her her future more more than, you know, writing, really honest stuff. But yeah, cause she she like gets to the bottom of the and and finds you know she she gets all this, you know, um, evidence about the things he's done and she you know the the um ah, what's it called she gets it to the the parents and the church and the whole it's just yeah and what on earth does that mean um okay I want to have to uh, uh let's see yeah and you know Tom says he wishes he was happy let's see and Yeah, and and you know Mary, and um, let's see, Mary, Liz, and Ellie, you know, they talk about the the money, and Liz realizes that you know, um, because he had lied about being poor, you know, she kept, you know, she she did. Uh, what was it? She walked through the snow when the machine broke down. And, you know, he said, like, I, I did, I, I tried to, you know, I kept telling you, I'll pay for it, you know. And, yeah, the, the, um, what's it called? Um, oh, right, right, yeah, I, you know, I, I feel like that brings up, you know, yeah, another aspect where the movie is clearly progressive and something I really appreciated, the movie, you know, basically, one of the reasons that, you know, yeah, yeah technically he could afford it, but that would, that not, might mean that Ellie doesn't have much of a, a future, at the end of the day, you know, he would have to pay for health insurance if he, you know, yeah, so the, the, and, you know, when her truck broke, she couldn't afford to fix it herself, so she had to, you know, how absurd is that, that you, you know, she had to, you know, walk through the snow you know, just, yeah, the, these are things that clearly the government should take care of, and, you know, if, if America would just trim a tiny bit of the fat off the military budget, there, there would be plenty of money for these kinds of things. You know, that's the thing, like, Liz helps Charlie basically because she's a good friend to him, you know, because they bonded over Alan. They they both lost Alan. If that wasn't the case, he would literally be alone. Like, he can't afford... Or, yeah, you know, he shouldn't have to pay for someone to take care of him, and he does need someone to take care of him, you know, clearly. Like, even if he is just going to... If, if he just wants to to die within days like the the you know the the okay yeah bad example once he has resigned himself to to death 
you know, there's there's not much. Well, y yeah, the the um, at that point, basically all you can really do is try to make it not be more like, you know, um, what's it called? You know, there there's some bare minimum stuff you could still do to to not make his death more painful than it has to be. But before that, you know, like, it's been years since Alan died, and the... I forget, did we get a number? Let's see, the... He was... Yeah, it was after the... Let's see, it was like eight years since the 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 divorce yeah i'm not sure we we do know how many years it's been since alan died but but yeah you know for that time like how absurd is it that there isn't someone being paid to to take care of of charlie that he has to rely on this this bond he has with Liz. Now, let's see. I appreciate we we get you know Mary and Charlie talk about the details of the divorce. You know it the the and I also really I I, I really appreciate a piece of of Western media that points out you know it features a divorce where it doesn't just say oh you know women are terrible when it comes to divorce they just want everything that you know everything the man did everything the man built and she didn't even work for that you know she just tolerated him for a while no here is one that legitimately says there's you know divorce gets really bad um what's the word yeah you know some people get really harsh when it comes to divorce and i, I forget if, i'm not sure she says it directly but like i got the sense from mary like she wanted to protect ellie like if she you know when they got the divorce first of all it was Charlie who wanted a divorce. It wasn't Mary. She agreed to the divorce, but it was Charlie who wanted it. And after that, like, how do you let... The, you know, it's it has nothing to do with the the, the gayness or the, the, the weight issues, which at the, that time wasn't... You know, they weren't huge. That was not an intentional... You know, the, the weight was more under control at that time. No... He abandoned his eight-year-old daughter, you know, and he did later say, well, you know, who would want me to be part of their life? You know, that's how, you know, that's why he did it, but he did do it. You know, he did actually choose to, to, so, so, yeah, you know, and the, and the movie isn't letting him off the hook for that, you know, and yeah. You know, she, yeah, Mary wanted to protect Ellie from getting attached to Charlie only for Charlie to leave again. Now, uh, let's see, there was another thing that I wanted to, um, but, but yeah, you know, a number of times the, the divorce is something that um, a man does, you know, to the woman that he was married to, and yeah, you know, the the person who um, div divorce is sometimes something where, uh, you know, one or both of the the party parties like get very cruel and vindictive towards the other. It's not just you know, yeah, there are some women who do that. There's also a lot of guys who do that.
and yeah, we see that you know Ellie is basically you know cyberbullying Charlie and Mary. And I can't help but notice that there are a couple of times where sometimes it's Liz, sometimes it's Mary. They're very close to Charlie, and it's like almost a hug, and just yeah, you know the the there is a a um, a closeness, and yeah, it is probably this the the you know, Christ metaphor thing where, you know, uh, let's see, what is it? God is love, and if you, you know, if you honestly let God into your heart, you will be happy, you will be, you will, f uh, uh, you will be comforted, kind of thing. Now, yeah, this is where I noted, there's a lot of Charlie getting rejected in this movie. And we see that the plate for the birds was broken. And honestly, that was probably Ellie. You know, she felt... Uh, she was jealous that he was taking care of the birds, but not her. And Dan, the pizza guy, you know, usually does agree to leave. But this time, he did stay for a little bit to, to see... Charlie and he is shocked and Charlie eats until he throws up which is very uncomfortable to watch and let's see. yeah and then then Thomas tells Charlie that Ellie sent the proof and you know now his family just want him to come home Uh, let's see, right. I, I did want to briefly note that nobody is particularly happy that Tom is around, but Ellie is the only one who actually probes and realizes that there's, like, something wrong, like his story doesn't add up kind of thing. You know, she... Uh, let's see, what was it she said? She talked to one of her classmates, who was a new lifer, and he said that they stopped going door to door. So she knows that he can't be honestly doing that. He wouldn't be going door to door if he were. And the, the, yeah, you know, the, like, this thing of, you know, it has to be honest, it has to be true, it has to, you know, uh, what's the word? Um, yeah, the, the um, yeah, I think honest is the one, is the word they, they keep using. You know, she is the one, she is very, she is like, way too honest and she gets other people to to become more honest as well and yeah Tom blames you know he thinks that Alan died because of the the gayness and let's see. Yeah, and, and Charlie tells Tom about the, you know, yeah, some, some details about the, the gay lovin', and it, it, you know, culminates in Tom calling him disgusting, and... I don't really know, I guess, I, um, maybe I'll think of it later, but right now I'm not entirely sure what Aronofsky is getting at there. I, I don't know, I guess maybe 
that a lot of people are more homophobic than they maybe think, or I, I don't know. And yeah, you know, the movie basically oversimplifies as honesty is always a good thing when there are definitely times where it isn't. And yeah, Charlie reads honest stuff that the the others that, that his students wrote and activates the webcam and we see their reaction to his body and some of them are like struggling to not laugh at him it just yeah it was it was very uncomfortable and I don't I'm not entirely sure what the the movie is really trying to do there I yeah now let's see the yeah the the let's see the yeah so the quotes from the essay that Charlie really loves is an essay written by Ellie four years prior. I honestly, I thought that it was like Alan who wrote that, you know, that that was why he kept, but no, the, the whole time it was Ellie's essay. And the, you know, he, he, Charlie asks Ellie, you know, that I, I will just briefly say, I it felt a little we it I guess it's a Hollywood thing, huh? The this thing of okay, so she thought that he would write an essay that would get her a passing like like a good grade in it. And she didn't even look at the essay that he gave. So she handed it in and then it turns out, you know, oh yeah, it wasn't like, apparently, the essay that he gave her to hand in was, you know, for the, the what was it called, um, Moby Dick, when the, the thing that she was apparently, if, yeah, if I, yeah, it was the, it was that Walt Whitman poem that she was supposed to, to give an essay on. And, yeah, I get it. it like, I know, it's not supposed to be reality. I gotta say, if it was reality, I'd be like, obviously don't, you don't, if you want her to have a good future, then don't, you know, have that kind of screw up, because it really, it didn't need to be, like, you could have had her come back and say, you know, you did it, the, the, you know, I got a I got a good grade. The you know the the essay I wrote that that you wrote for me was was fully accepted, and you know then he he could hand her the the you know yeah this this the the essay that she wrote four years prior about Moby Dick. You know, I I really felt like the yeah, I, I didn't think it was necessary to have the the added drama of her, like, yeah. But but yeah, you know, and and the let's see. Yeah, he he asks her, you know, read the the essay to me, and first she says "fuck you," and then she says "daddy, please." You know, so it is as if she has become, um, what's the word? Um, yeah, when, when you, crap, it's, uh, 
um, when when the yeah it's like it's like she's a small child again you know using the word daddy and you know she opens the door and it's magic hour so that's yeah and the yeah you know she um yeah he 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 stands up and he starts to walk towards her standing at the door and we get the the ending which is the the one time that you can't take what you're seeing literally as his his feet lift off the floor you know he is ascending and it it goes to you know the the screen goes completely white and <clears throat> the end credits start rolling not long after so yeah it's it wouldn't be in you know it's it's Darren Aronofsky so yeah it's we we get a an ending that has this kind of bittersweet but like you know there's really no way to read it he like he for sure dies but like he may be goes to heaven you know be yeah through like the you know he manages to to reach Ellie he manages to to get to to her and that was the thing that he you know we 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 only realized near the end how long that has been on his mind you know that really the the poem every single time which you know obviously the fact that he goes between masturbating to gay porn forget the gay part masturbating you know, he yeah, he masturbates, he thinks he's having a heart attack, he thinks he's gonna die, and he asks a complete stranger, please read my daughter's words, you know, from, what was it, four years ago, so, what was it, middle school or something, that is probably something that we're not supposed to really think about, but yeah. Let's see. And it didn't like ruin the movie. I just couldn't help but notice. That brings us to the final section. Notes taken before watching. So gonna get to the bottom. Here we go. So, uh right, some critic quotes. Charlie is basically committing suicide through overeating, which is an addiction. An attempt to grieve or failing that, join his lover in death. If you look at the whale as a fable, its moral is that the, it's the responsibility of the abused to love and forgive their abusers. The movie thinks it's saying, you don't understand, he's fat because he's suffering, but it ends up saying, you don't understand, we have to be cruel to fat people because we are suffering. Aronofsky and Hunter's biblical metaphor aside, fat people didn't volunteer to serve as repositories for society's rage and contempt. No one agrees to be bullied so the bully can feel better about themselves. That's a self-serving lie bullies tell themselves. This is an externally imposed martyrdom which negates the point of the exercise. True. You don't have to love movies like Jojo Rabbit and the producers, but at least they were made by men who identify as Jewish. Some of these sensitive subjects should only be handled by people who've lived it. Now, according to... Uh, right. Yes, one positive is that according to Fraser, in an interview, the Obesity Action Coalition, an advocacy group they worked with, the number of people who reached out to them for help has gone way up since the release of the movie. Now, let's see. So, yeah, um, not all, you know, so, some people, sadly, there's a lot in, in Western culture that 
yeah, maybe especially American culture that kind of trains us to think of, you know, overweight people as weak, that they, they just, you know, if they would just pull themselves together and stop eating so much, uh, you know, or do, doing more exercise, yeah, exercising and, and stuff like that, but it's not, you know, some, some people eat a lot and gain nothing. Some people eat very healthy and yet gain weight. You know, it's not only about the, the what you eat and how how much you exercise. Also, a number of people, you know, if you're poor in America, you might not be able to get healthy food because the the stuff that will make you gain weight is cheaper to buy and there are more places that sell it. And let's see. Yeah, some some people become obese because of genetics. Let's see. Not sleeping enough, which again, if you're if you're poor and you maybe have you know, a lot of stress, maybe you have a job, maybe you have you know, maybe you're struggling in school or something. Yeah. Uh, let's see, some people struggle to lose weight that they gain during pregnancy. And let's see, uh, PCOS, Prater, Willie, Cushing, and Hypothyroidism, and Osteoarthritis. You know, so it can give the wrong impression to focus the movie on, you know, this basic, you know, he is basically committing suicide at, at this point. Maybe it didn't, you know, yeah, maybe it didn't start that way. Maybe at first it was just a way to, to deal, but uh, now let's see. Yeah, so, um, let's see. Aronofsky gives us strong images. Sometimes they're richly beautiful, as a lot of the nature in Noah. Sometimes they're one or more of the following. Disgusting, nasty, violent, disturbing, grotesque, gruesome, brutal. The poking at the brain in pie. The fridge and arm in Requiem for Dream. Drinking sap in the fountain. The blade in the wrestler. Picking at the finger in Black Swan. The brief but detailed vision of the sins of man that Noah gets. Let's see. Yeah, and I, you know, I'm I'm not saying those are the only examples of that. I'm just giving uh, at least one example per movie is what I'm saying. This this is actually the first movie that he's made where there is no breaking of skin or even flesh, gore or blood. I I didn't I would not have guessed that. You know, I've I've been watching Aronofsky movies yeah, I guess 20 years. Um, yeah. And I I would never have guessed that he would actually go and and make Cuz yeah, there there really there isn't a single shot that that has the actual, you know, we we can see that like his body has been really you know has has taken a lot of damage from the you know yeah the the things but there isn't yeah that is it for so yeah um that's it for the the video let me know in the comments what is what's your favorite aronofsky movie or you know, what, yeah, is there something you think that, <clears throat> do you have like a suggestion for what you would like to see him do next? You know, whether it's, you know, go go buck wild, whether you have like an idea where you're like, this is right up his alley, or you you can come at it from the other way and say, this is completely unlike anything else he's ever done, and I think he would be great for it let me know.
If you like this video, please thumbs up, subscribe, hit that little bell. There should be a link to my main channel page, one, two more links to stuff like relevant playlists, say suggest the video for you to watch on the screen right about now. I put out one vlog per week reviewing and sharing spoiler thoughts on a movie, and one talking about my spoiler thoughts on the most recent episode of the current Disney Plus Star Wars show, which these days is The Mandalorian. And recently the review and thoughts videos tend to come out very similar to this one. In other words, if you want more videos like this, you're in luck. You can check out my back catalog, so let's catch my next week. I hope you enjoyed watching as I enjoyed watching and recording, and I will catch you next time.